Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today for another fantastic virtual gardening workshop. My name is Kendra Runnels and I'm at the Cowichan Branch in Duncan on the traditional and unceded territories of the Kowatsan or Cowichan tribes people. April Ripley is behind the scenes, the coordinator of this program. She is at the our harbor front branch in Nanaimo on the traditional unceded territories of the Snunamek First Nations. And we like to start every workshop by thanking the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association and especially Joanne Canning. Uh, they make these workshops happen, their partnership with us. We're so grateful. These are fantastic. Uh, as you notice, you're all muted. So please use your chat feature at the bottom of the page. Put in any comments or questions that you have throughout the presentation. And Joanne and I will get to them at the end of the talk. Um, we are recording the session today, but don't worry, none of your personal information will be recorded. Uh, the only thing that will be recorded is the slideshow and the speaker, so no worries. You can have your videos off or on. We love it when you have them on so we can see your faces, but it's up to you. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenter today, Joanne Barwise. She will share her expertise on planting for pollinators. Joanne is a recent graduate of the Master Gardeners Association, Vancouver Island. She is also an active member of the Nanaimo Beekeepers Club. She's a certified pollinator steward with Pollinator Partnership Canada. She raises both honeybees and mason bees. She has enjoyed a long career as an environmental educator and has published several, several articles and a book. She loves nothing more than convincing people that planting for pollinators is both very important and very addictive. So without further ado, here's Joanne. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I would like to thank the uh, Vancouver Island Regional Library and the Master Gardeners Association for this opportunity to do this session, which is very important to me. This session is very graphic heavy. I have a lot of images um, and I've given credit uh, wherever possible and I've used a lot with permission. So let's introduce you to uh, the session. This session, planning for pollinators, is really all about pollination. These are the workhorses of pollination and they are our little superheroes. And you can see how they are our little superheroes. Many people, when they come to sessions, they want quick answers. They want pop-up gardens, but that's not how I'm approaching this. I'm approaching pollination like it's a story. It begins millions of years ago. It's got lots of characters, lots of interactions with each of the characters. There's some life histories in there, but the ending of this story um, ends with you. I'll be talking about native plants and native bees. Both are those that have evolved and adapted to a specific location and have remained genetically unaltered by humans. So they've been here before colonization and um, that's what I'm speaking about today, both plants and pollinators. So what I'm talking about here is an outline. Who are the pollinators, the characters of our story? The components of habitat principles of planting for pollinators. Butterflies require their own topic of conversation. I'll talk a bit about uh, some resources. I've given you a four, well, I'll talk about that later. And um, also we'll have a Q and A session at the end. So who are the pollinators? Well, pollination takes a guild. It takes, and you probably know a lot of these, birds and bats and butterflies and moths and flies and beetles and wasps and small mammals. Anything that visits a flower is potentially a pollinator. And pollination in itself is an interesting phenomenon. For example, a watermelon doesn't get to admit it to pollination until it gets 70 D visits. A cucumber, 24 to 30 visits. If you thought it was one, I used to think it was just one touch of pollen and it would be done. No, that's not how it works. Uh, pumpkins, 19 visits. So uh, going back to the watermelon, 
If done research, it takes a thousand and one grains of pollen to be evenly distributed for it to grow into a perfect watermelon. So these pollinators do a lot for us. And it's really important because it can affect all the way up to the grizzly bears. If we don't have pollination, we don't have berries and the grizzly bears don't get their food for the winter. So in Canada, there are 800 plus species of native bees. Here in British Columbia, we have 450 species of native bees and the highest density is in the Southern interior, 400 species. We're currently in the Georgian depression with 150 species of bees. And as you go further north, you can see the species because of the habitat uh, gets less and less, 77 in the Northern Boreal. Uh, Canada with 800 species, the US has 4,000 just because of that diverse habitat. And of course, worldwide, there's 20,000 species of native bees. So bees are considered a keystone species. A keystone, if you recall, is that very specific um, brick or uh, element in an arch that holds it all together. It's the last piece to go in and it will hold the arch strong and true for, for thousands of years. So bees have an essential role in maintaining structure of an ecosystem. They ensure the reproduction of 90% of flowering plants and the organisms that depend on most plants for survival. And it's necessary for pollination of two thirds of the world's crop species. So they say one in every uh, three bites you have is thanks to pollinators. So bees are a key stone species. It all began down here. I want you to look in the bottom. Down in the Jurassic period, there were wasps and you can see a wasp here on this flower. At that time, wasps were parasitic. They would lay their eggs into other insects and then they would uh, grow and develop in that insects and thus cause death to the host. Um, but coming into the Cretaceous period, you have flowers. And once those parasitic wasps turned to feeding on flowers and feeding on the pollen, they became bees. So bees were parasitic wasps that started using pollen. And we'll see later that bees and wasps aren't that far off in terms of uh, their structural, uh, how, how they look and how they behave. So I'll get into that later. So for bees, it's all about the pollen. A bee travels from flower to flower collecting pollen on its body. The bonus is po pollination, but the prize is nectar. Honey bees uh, prefer the high nectar content. Native bees prefer the high pollen content. So you'll get bees that are generalists, you'll get bees that are specialists, and not all flowers and pollen are created equally. So bees, you know, they have different uh, phenology, different flowering times, they have different smells, different visual cues, different pollen morphology. So you'll see as we go through here, um, the differences. I'm just gonna do a quick review of the flower because on the uh, anther is where the pollen is and the idea is to travel from flower to flower and to drop that pollen onto the female part, and thus you end up with the fruit being pollinated. But at the bottom, this is the cool thing. Uh, I never knew where uh, nectar came from, but there's special glands in a flower called nectaries, and they're at the bottom. So for the bees to get the reward of nectar, they have to dig down, and as a result, they get all that pollen, and they go from flower to flower. Nectar. Uh, has a concentration of 8% to as high as 50%. Just to give you a little bit of a connection to that, Coca-Cola is 10% for comparison. So can you imagine flowers having 50% uh, of uh, sugars? So the other thing about flowers and bees in this uh, co uh, 
co-creation and co-evolution is that flowers have a negative charge and bees as they're flying around create sort of a static charge and they have a positive charge. And that charge is what helps to draw them in and also for that pollen to land and attach to their body. So who knew of that connection? The different categories of bees, just to get everybody straight, I have honeybees, I manage them. There's managed bees. And you may, if you don't live near a beekeeper, you may see honeybees, but they may be from a feral uh, colony and bees swarm all the time. We, we do everything we can to stop them from swarming, but they do go out and they live in hollow trees and hollow buildings. And they are constant. Uh, when we manage our bees, we have the same bees we've had for five, six, many, many years. It's the same colony. There's just this turnover of bees in it and queen. Native bees is what I'll be talking about today. Native bees are the ones that live on the land. 90% of them are solitary. I mean, they live by themselves. They don't live in a colony like, man, like honeybees. And so that means the bumblebee is at 10%. They're semi-social, and I'll talk about how they organize themselves, but 90% of our native bees are solitary. Now, of all the native bees, most of them live underground. So this is really critical for habitat, and 30% live above ground in cavities and woody stems and tunnels. So this is important for habitat as well. So we're gonna look at the uh, underground and the social life of a bumblebee below ground. So she emerges in the spring, she starts to feed and she looks for a place to uh, a cavity and she needs a cavity so she can go in there and she makes wax pots and fills it full of nectar and she collects pollen and will lay an egg in the pollen and she incubates those and she'll have several of them and as they hatch they help the queen, uh, the, the queen bumblebee. So there's a lot of them uh, incubating the queen, and you can have up to 400 bumblebees in a colony in this cavity here. Uh, the queens emerge, they mate, they overwinter in leaf litter, they overwinter in wherever they can, and then the cycle starts again. But they need a little chamber. Uh, it starts with a hole, sometimes they're underground to find that chamber. Uh, this is one that was open. It was in some uh, some debris, uh, some moss, and these are probably the cocoons of the uh, the bumblebees. So other bees that live underground don't need the chambers like the bumblebee. What they will do is they'll dig tunnels and they'll lay an egg with some pollen, and they'll dig another tunnel, lay an egg with some pollen, which is called bee bread. These bees are not aggressive, so it's a it's a nest with low activity. If you do see bees going underground, mark it with a popsicle stick. So you can watch it and see if it's used next year. But I, I wasn't gonna say much about uh, wasps here. I think it's really important that when you see a lot of activity, it could be a yellow jacket wasp. They're very aggressive when it comes to defending the nest. Uh, they have ne nest aggression by themselves, they're not. Uh, but they would uh, make their paper nest underground. But it's this activity that you see that you should be aware of. If you see that, mark that with a bigger stick so you don't go near it. But uh, let it do its life cycle because it, at the end of the summer, these will all be dead and there'll only be a queen left. So it'll be an inactive nest at the end of the year. So I wanna talk about above ground, these solitary bees that live above ground. And that was about 30%. She will gather an egg. Now this, this is a misleading sort of graphic because they're in two, this is a tube. I want you to think of this as a tube, a reed, uh, like a, or a cane, uh, or like the mason bee house, it's in a, it's in a tube. She will collect uh, pollen, and mix it with nectar and it forms this bee bread and lay her egg on it. And the larva, as it grows, will feed and pupate. And uh, in that chamber, okay, they close them off by different methods, but that is the brood chamber for that particular bee. The adult emerges and it keeps, the cycle keeps going. 
Now, I, I don't want to get you mixed up about uh, bees. What I want you to do is to fill yourself with awe and wonder about how wonderfully different and diverse the bees are. I, I don't want you to memorize anything. Uh, just get an understanding. So again, we have uh, non-native bees, which are the honeybees. They were introduced with the, the settlers uh, coming to uh, the new country. And native bees, they've always been here. So we have our bumblebees, which I, I, I did tell you about. They're chambers underground. And we have six bumblebees on Vancouver Island. And there's an app called Inside Citizen Science. And they, they want you to look at bees like hairy leg bees, or hairy belly bees, and know your bumblebee and other bees. So that's kind of how I uh, structured this a little bit, but also in terms of family, uh, bee families as well. So some of these might sound familiar, uh, the hairy leg bees, sweat bees, mining bees, fairy bees, polyester bees. What? Yeah, polyester bees and plaster bees. These are really interesting. Hairy belly bees, we get our leaf cutter bees. I'm sure you've heard of those. We get some metallics, the mason bees, the blue orchard bees, which we talked about, which I mentioned earlier. And in this hairy belly category, we have another non-native, the wool carter bee. So we actually have two non-native bees there. And these are quite aggressive. They were brought in just for pollination. And we have other bees. We got cuckoo bees, yellow-faced bees, and carpenter bees. So I want to tell you about the hairy leg bees before we get into the family of bees. These bees, you know, bees have a head, thorax, and an abdomen, but they're hairy legs. They have um, the pollen they collect, and bees are adapted. They're so hairy, they're adapted to collect pollen. It goes down their entire leg. And you can see here how hairy that leg is. Look. They're collecting pollen on the leg. And that's called pollen pants, which I think is hilarious. They have pollen pants when they go back uh, and hairy leg. So the first family of bees, you can see I put here, pollen pants or hairy leg, is the Melic today. Uh, me and Latner are not good friends. In uh, the world, there are seven families of bees. Here in British Columbia, we have six families. Uh, the seventh family is in Australia. Uh, I'm gonna start with the bees you're probably the least familiar with and go to the um, one you're most familiar with. So it's not in an order of importance or population, uh, it's just the way I've organized it. So this, uh, family has one species that does occur in BC. Uh, this one is unique because it cocoons uh, as a pupa and it hibernates over the winter uh, as a pupa. So it's capable of hibernation, which is different than the, the bumblebee where only the queen uh, emerges. So this bee is a specialist. It only lives on the, uh, and I might be saying this wrong, um, please forgive, by Simatia flowers, the creeping jenny, also known as the money board. Um, they're a ground nesting bird, but they are specialists. So that's the Mela today. And they have palm pants. So the second family is Halliptidae. Now these are the furrow bees and the sweat bees. They also are hairy leg bees, or they have palm pants. And you can see how hairy they are. They're hairy all over the place. This is a good time to be, be hairy. The third uh, family is the Colic today. These are the polyester, the cellophane, uh, the yellow faced bees. Um, they're short tongue bees. Now, there's short tongue, long tongue, medium tongue bees. They come in all facets of tongue length, I guess, like people, but they, that makes them specialists and also makes them very uh, to develop a relationship with certain flowers. So what the uh, short, these polyester bees, they secrete a, a waterproof lining around their nest to protect the young from water. So remember I showed you the tunnel with the little chambers. They would have that all protected uh, with this waterproof uh, lining. It's, um, she secretes, it's called a, a linalool uh, into the cells as well, which is a fungicide and a bactericide. 
So uh, she secretes this um, cellophane-like uh, substance from a gland near her uh, near her rear end, uh, close to her her stinger. So she works very hard at lining that and protecting the the brood. Uh, the yellow face bee, which is also part of this family, they don't collect. They have very little hair. So what they do is they ingest the pollen. Uh, and then they regurgitate it uh, when they get back to the nest. Very big, pollen pants, you can see the pants. The fourth family is the Andrinidae, the mining bees and the fairy bees. The fairy bee is the smallest bee, it's called the Perdita, uh, the smallest bee in uh, BC. Um, so what they do is in this family, they make the chambers and they pat down the soil and create a nice stable wall for uh, the brood chamber. Pollen pants. Fifth family is the Melachilidae. Now this is where we get into um, collecting pollen under the belly. Uh, this is a picture of a uh, mason bee. To me, they look like the hummer of the bees. They look like a big black fly, but they're big. Um, and they're so docile, they, they won't hurt you at all. They're hairy. And if you watch them coming in, they'll have a lot of pollen under their belly. So they're called hairy belly bees. So, so we have mason bees, leaf cutter bees, wool cutter bees, and resin bees. And we'll talk about more of those later. The leaf cutter bee is part of this. And I want you to look at her abdomen. When she approaches a flower, she always puts the tip of her abdomen up and you can see all that hair under there. And uh, that's where, if you see one loaded with pollen, it'll be bright, bright yellow or whatever the col color of the pollen is. She cuts out these perfect circles from leaves and there's some that use flowers as well. And then she takes that and makes a little sleeping bag for her brood chamber. They have really big mandibles for the chewing of the leaf. So she's an above ground um, nester. This is the orchard uh, bee, the mason bee. You've, you've seen a lot of the mason bee houses. This is one of the tubes. You can see the pollen, the bee bread, the pollen's been mixed with nectar. The eggs are laid and they come out and they eat that and then they pupate and then they a cocoon, and this is for the mason bee. Now, I want to show you this one. These are other ones. This is the leaf cutter bee. She makes these little packages with the circle she cuts out, and that's her brood chamber for each little uh, pollen and egg, and they will emerge from there. The resin bee, the chambers are divided. She gets resin from trees, and that's what she uses to. Uh, create the chamber. And in here you see the larva, but all this black stuff, that's frass. That's the poop that's being, after being uh, eaten and eliminated, that, that, that's the poop that they leave behind. And then of course we have the resin, uh, the mason bee, sorry. And that's uh, what I showed you in the previous slide. They uh, make a cocoon around themselves, that's frass. And then um, they emerge in the spring from that's pretty incredible when you see the insides like that. That's a lot of hard work if you've ever watched them. They work tirelessly. I have to tell you about this one, the wool carter bee. I had an experience with one. Look at this tube up here. They chew and take the fluff off uh, of plants like the tiny hairs off mullen or lamb's ear and they gather it. And again, they use that to surround and make the brood chamber for their, their little ball of pollen. And, and the egg. So I had gone in to uh, pick up my garden gloves and they must've been there for a while because I put my finger in the garden glove. Oh gee, there's a great big uh, cotton ball in there. It was quite soft. Well, I just can't get a hold of it with the end of my finger and I turned it inside out and it was full of this, full of these with pollen and um, all the, uh, the fibers. And then I put on the other glove and. <laughs> There's another more in a finger. So I've learned to fold over the ends of my garden gloves to keep out the wool carter bees. 
So now we're into the Apidae, and these are the bees you're probably the most familiar with, but they're not more important. You just probably seen them more of them around. Uh, you get the bumblebees, the digger bees, the carpenter bees, the honey bees, the sunflower bees. Um, and they, are, they have very specialized Apidae. They have uh, pollen baskets. Uh, they don't, uh, very specialized uh, organ on, on their thigh called the corpicula. And uh, it's more specialized here. It's just how they carry it. It looks more like a basket. I wanted to talk to you about the carpenter bee because this bee is a giant. It can be from three quarters to an inch long. Um, but don't, don't worry about them. Just enjoy the size of them. Uh, you can get small carpenter bees and big ones. But the, the reason I want you to look at this one is because you look at that hole she makes. She will do that into uh, structures like cedar structures or redwood. And they get a bad rap because you'll have a nest in there. But as I say, let them do their thing. And then uh, after the season is over and then you can um, fix what you need to fix. But don't exterminate a nest if you can. There are also small carpenter bees and they will nest in uh, rose stems, uh, cut rose stems and uh, berry canes. So they're not all giants. Again, I wanna talk about the bumblebee. Bumblebees like the panda bear of the bees are just so adorable once you start looking at them. Uh, they have pollen saps in their thighs, this whole family. They have the, uh, the corbicula. Uh, they have four wings, all bees have four wings. They're very fat and tumbular looking, just like a panda bear. Um, they always, they're always moving. And I read one article uh, where the guy said, um, they have to eat continually to keep warm. A bumblebee with a full stomach is only uh, 40 minutes from starvation. I'm thinking, wow, that's, uh, that's not very long, you know. Uh, and a single bumblebee can get enough energy from one fireweed flower, not the whole plant, the flower, to give her enough to forage around for 14 minutes. So two or three flowers would give a honeybee a whooping load of nectar. So they're always working when you start looking at honeybees. And again, they need sort of mouse burrows or they need those cavities underground. Here are Vancouver Island uh, honeybees. We've got the uh, black-tailed honeybee up here. It's got a red end, you see a lot of those. Um, I don't know why it's called black tail when it's got the red end, but whatever. Uh, we have the two-form bumblebee. It's right on the abdomen uh, and the tip is yellow. And then it has two spots right there to tell uh, on the thorax. Uh, then we have the mixed bumblebee. Uh, it's also called the fuzzy horn bumblebee, tricolored bumblebee, orange belt. It, it doesn't really matter, but it's got a rusty end and it's not as red as the others, but it's got a rusty, rusty end. Um, the this is the one that is listed uh, at risk. It's not very common. Uh, and it, uh, Kosiewicz has risk, uh, listed it as um, at risk. So if you do see them, uh, let the right people know, the Western bumblebee. Uh, this one um, is the yellow face bumblebee, big yellow face. They're big, they're black. And this one has two, um, two colors. A yellow face with a yellow stripe or an orange abdomen in, in, in the insert comes with another color. So, you know, I'm not, I don't have an eye to tell them, but I do see these, I see these. Just keep your eyes open and see how, how you do. So one of the things about bumblebees that's interesting is they uh, pollinate some plants by sonification. Some plants need to be persuaded. So the bumblebee will use her mandibles and she'll hang on and she starts vibrating here in her thorax to release the pollen. And I've given you in the handout a link so you can watch a video and see that puff of pollen coming out. Uh, and it's in the frequency of C. Yeah, in the frequency of C. So plants like tomatoes, eggplants, and potatoes uh, need to be persuaded a little bit. 
you can do it yourself if you take the end off uh, an electric toothbrush and you put it in there or you get a tuning fork uh, in the note of C and you can persuade that pollen out. Honeybees, I would be amiss if I didn't talk about them. They're not a native bee, they're introduced, they're managed. Uh, you will see a lot of them. Um, you will see some, I don't know if you'll see a lot of them, but there they have their pollen basket. If it was pollen pants, it'd be all the way down, but they have a corbicula. When they get all covered with pollen, they just break it all down and gather it up here and they stick it with a little bit of nectar so it stays there. They're striped. They're adorable is all I can say, they're just adorable. So. I wanna to talk to you about cuckoo bees. Uh, cuckoo bees, um, they are nest parasites. And believe it or not, they're a bioindicator of a healthy host population. So when you see them, it means there's a, there's a good population out there of bees. Uh, they are a kleptoparasite, which means that they will kill the host larva, feed on the pollen and nectar provided by that host bee. So they don't collect pollen, they just go in and lay their eggs. Uh, when the female leaves, they'll go in and lay their eggs where she has laid her egg. And of course, it's a little tricky when they try to emerge. So timing is everything, but they emerge a little bit earlier than the host bee. In every family of bees, there are cuckoo bees. So everybody has a plane. Other pollinators, we have the uh, hoverfly, Wasps, hornets, and yellow jackets, and butterflies. I want to talk about the hoverfly or the serpent fly. They are a fly. They are not a bee. They have two pairs of wings, itsy bitsy short antenna, huge sea goggle, uh, uh, sea goggle uh, ski. I don't know what I'm saying. Ski goggle uh, eyes, and they are hairless but they are such good pollinators. And they're also very good at um, eating some of the uh, pests like uh, aphids and other problem insects that are in the garden. So they like to hover around. This would be called a mimic because it looks like a bee, but look at those big eyes. Look at those itsy bitsy antenna. Uh, and these are great little things to have in your garden and they hover. Surfeit flies. You may see wasps. Now wasps have a very long skinny body. They have uh, four narrow wings um, and they have skinny thighs. So you can see they're like the Barbie dog, skinny pinched waist, skinny thighs, hairless, but because they visit flowers, of course I would say that's hair. They do um, pollinate. Here's some of the wasps. I'm sure you've heard of the giant Asian hornet. A lot of people will see the ball-faced hornet and say that's the giant Asian. It's not. It's a big hornet, but it's black and white. And these are some of the other things you'll see. Pinched waist, skinny thighs, big antenna. So let's review again some of the characteristics of flies and wasps. Flies have two pairs of wings, or two wings, I'm sorry, one pair. Bees and wasps have two pairs, so you can think of that evolutionary history that they have. Uh, the eyes on a fly take up most of their face because they have those ski goggle eyes, and bees and wasps not so much. The hind legs are skinny on a fly, uh, thick on a bee, and skinny on a wasp. Uh, they have hairs, uh, flies, uh, they, and they have similar hairs on a wasp. But the thing about bees is their hairs are not straight. They're branched. So if you have one hair, it's branch, 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 lots of branches off one shaft. So it makes them look fuzzy and it gives them that ability to get all that pollen. And of course, the antenna on a bee are stubby and on bees and wasps, they're long. So there's tells. The tell, when you're looking at a fly, will be the antenna and the lack of hair, and on bees, the tail will be um, fuzziness, and on a wasp, it'll be those skinny legs. 
So here you go, just another Uku. Look at that B. Furry. They don't have those big eyes. Look at the eyes on a fly. So if you can say big eyes, fly, small antenna, there's the tail right there. Wasp, pinched waist, skinny thighs. And furry B. So would you like to play a game of BFW? B flyer wasp? Well, let's go. There's no marks, just have fun. So what is this? A bee flyer wasp. This is a fly because of the short linen antenna and look at the eyes. It's called a bee fly. What is this? Bee fly or wasp? It looks pretty hairy, yes. Look at the eyes, not ski goggles, long antenna. That is your blue mason bee. It's a bee. Just go for bee fly or wasp. I'll just tell you the species. What's this? This is, this. This is a surfeit fly. There's the little antenna, big ski goggle eyes, and it's a mimic. So it looks like a bee. It's mimicking, it's a fly mimicking a bee. What is this? Long antenna, furry. Oh, here's a tail. Here's a tail right here. Furry abdomen. This is a hairy belly bee. That's all you need to know, a hairy belly bee. Other evidence nearby? Some cutting. This is a leaf cutter bee. The little darlings. This looks like a monster. Don't be afraid. It's not that big. It's just a close up. But you can look at the antenna. They're small. Look at those eyes. This is called the robber fly. It's meant to look like a bee. See, some flies are hairy and some are not. You just got to go by these tails. Okay, what do we got here? This is you guys, not ski goggles. Look at this, hairy belly. This is a hairy belly bee. Awesome, it's a green metallic bee. What's this baby? Um, look for the antenna. There's no antenna, it's a fly, but it's fuzzy. Yeah, it's a fly. Oh, this is, these are my little darlings. This is the honeybee. Little eyes, furry. Don't see any pollen here, but they got nice big fat thighs. What's this? There's a tail for you. I think I already showed you this. I'm not sure. Uh, this is a short, a short antenna. This is a fly, uh, pinched waist. And again, what's this? Short antenna, big eyes. That's the fly as well. Am I going forward? I guess so. Here we go. Okay. So this one, it's a metallic pea, hairy, little eyes, fly, fuzzy legs, probably palm pants. Palm pants. Now I'm getting into habitat. Um, there's four components to habitat of all animals and people. The first is food. This is the plants that they eat, plants we provide, the native plants. The second is water. Third is space. We don't think of space actually a lot um, when we think of habitat, but we don't grow up in cubic feet. You know, we grow up with space and because uh, pollinators cover ground, they need space to fly, to search for food, to get their water. Um, and there's something that we can do to facilitate that. And they need shelter. They need shelter for uh, nesting, for overwintering. And uh, it also will indicate where you should be planting your garden. So these are the factors that affect our habitat. I'm, 
um, habitat loss, each of these affects each other. Um, and it affects the habitat. When you have habitat loss, then you have more insecticides, which could be a result of climate change, uh, adding more insecticides, it decreases habitat. Because of these stressors, you have uh, some parasites on uh, the, and diseases into the bees. Now, this is a particular picture of a honeybee with a varroa mite. Varroa mite. Uh, the mice don't kill the bees, but they cause them to uh, be less um, vital and uh, not up to 100%. They can kill a colony, it can weaken a colony. But if you were to compare that parasite to one on our human body, it would be as if we were carrying a basketball. So in terms of uh, size, it's quite a large one for a honeybee. But all these affect our little pollinators. So why are native plants so important? The native bees have co-evolved with native plants. Why wouldn't you? Um, this, this is what they've co-evolved with. Native plants are adapted to the local conditions. They will have a lot of success in your garden because they are adapted to these conditions, these weather conditions, the microclimates, all the things that we have. They require less water. And that's gonna be an important uh, topic when it comes to uh, changes in climate with climate change. They rarely get pest problems. They provide pollen and nectar throughout the season to our native pollinators. And they're more, four times more likely to attract native bees because that's what they like. They like those native plants. They provide the best nutrition for our native bees and provide resistance to disease and pesticide pressure. So when you're planning for pollinators, I want you to keep these principles in mind. And they're not, it's, they're not difficult. Plant a full range of blooms from spring to late summer and try to have at least three species at a time. And it's really important that you think about early and late seasons because you will have early bees like mason bees and bumblebees. They need those early plants and nectar uh, to keep going. Early and late, especially because they go into hibernation, they need food right to the, right to the very end before they hibernate. Plant a diverse of species, colors, sizes, types. Um, just make it like a wildflower garden. Consider nectar, pollen, and larval food. And when I talk of larval food, I'm talking about uh, butterflies, which I'll get into to later. And planting clusters, so it makes it easier for the, uh, the bees to go from one plant to another. Oh, and leave gaps for bare ground. Why for bare ground? Because the bare ground is where those ground, uh, those solitary bees go underground. If you cover with mulch, they can't get through it. Uh, so bare ground is really important for native bees. So this is a lovely garden. Uh, there's bare ground, there's no mulch, uh, a variety of heights, but they uh, group the plants uh, together, so you would have a grouping, and I'll show you that um, later on on uh, grouping your plants. I, I like this picture because it says it all. Um, it's, you can see where they're they've uh, planted in clumps, um, where there's a lot of the same together. Uh, the bee goes from one to another. Uh, the plants continue to provide nectar for revisits. Um, so they do their nectar uh, in the morning and their pollen in the afternoon. So go native, they're best adapted. Um, place big patches for, so they get the best foraging efficiency. Be patient, I planted a pond in your garden this, uh, this year. You gotta be patient and you'll keep adding to it. Be creative, uh, add some, uh, some stumps, some wood, driftwood for those uh, bees that like to uh, drill holes into uh, wood. Uh, no chemicals, you're going chemical free. Um, make it homey, put lots of dead branches. 
um, and debris around. You're not a tidy gardener when you are planting for pollinators. You're gonna give them lots of hollow twigs, uh, rotting logs, um, and leaves. Um, so be a little messy. Uh, and most of them live underground, remember. So uh, you want to facilitate that. So this is something I came upon from Guelph, which I thought was quite good. Um, I hope it's in the references, I don't recall. But uh, this gives you an idea of how to uh, plan your garden. Um, the, the, the solids here are uh, walking stones through here. They put in some wood here. Uh, and then you can see how they're grouped. There's a series, a series, a series. And it's quite attractive when you plant several of the same in bunches like that. And you can even repeat if you like. This is a repeat here repeat here, but they're in clumps. They're never ones, onesies or twosies, but threesies or fivesies. Mm -hmm. So this would be a little key to that particular garden. Um, they're planting the tallest here. Uh, so you would look here. Uh, so this here where I said there was a repeat, that would be this one here, which is the pearly everlasting. Um, so you can look here and go, uh, the blue aster has that symbol and they put it over here. So there's some clone flowers, got that. So you can find it on the map. Uh, but you get the idea. Um, But you get the idea of how to plant and how many you need and what the spacing is uh, for your, your do grasses, bunch grasses as well. Uh, the, the bumblebees like to nest under the grasses where there's that bare, uh, bare ground. Here's another thing to think about is that bees do not see the same way that we do. When it comes to seeing, they have a superpower of vision. Uh, bees do not see red. Uh, humans, we see red. We don't see infrared. Uh, that's when you put on those special goggles at night. Um, we don't see that, but we can see red all the way to violet. Bees see from orange all the way into the UV spectrum. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, that's interesting, you say. Well, it, it, it's more than interesting. This is how they see. Be when they come to yellow flowers, the yellow mixes with the, the UV and the flowers, these are uh, renditions by photographers in UV. They look like bullseyes. Come on in and get that ball. Come on in. I've got all of the nectar for you. And the bee gets it again drawn in you. So I told you before about the magnetic. Now this is what they see. This is called um, bee purple right here that you can't see it here, but with yellow and UV, they see this bee purple and they know exactly where to go. So they see the world in black and white, but when they approach a target, the colors come into focus for them and they know exactly where to go. Fascinating. Boy, you know, yeah, I know where to go there. Oh, look. It's like a road map. Beep, beep, beep. Come here, come here. So think about color when you're planting, choosing your plants for pollinators. Yellow, blue, purples. Uh, you can't plant for the UV, but this is the color scheme of the flowers uh, for, uh, for bees. Butterflies can see red. And they can go with this color scheme. Moths uh, are really good pollinators at night. So they like those flowers that open at night and they're light colored. You want to be able to see them. Flies, uh, it looks like the same for, um, for the moths. And hummingbirds, of course, like tubular flowers and they do like red and the oranges and the purples. But we are talking about the bees. So I want you to remember this palette here. So I'll give you a few tips and then uh, we'll talk about some of the plants. 
So when you're buying your plants, try to go to a, a native plant nursery. If not, make sure that your plants are not treated with neonicotinoids. Neonicotinoids are also called neonix pesticides because they're, they're systemic and they get all the way into the pollen, which again affects the pollinators. Always ask for native plants. The more we ask, the more they'll bring them in. Plant, plan for blooms all year. So you want your garden always blooming, early, middle, late. Make a bee bath. Um, I'll talk about this later. Not as simple as it sounds um, because the bees can drown. So I'll, I'll talk about that a bit. Be careful with your mower. You know, they're underground. They're going to have your popsicle sticks marked and where those holes are. Just remember, it's habitat uh, for some, especially on those bare patches. So you could raise your, uh, your, the blade of your mower. And there will be bees in the grass anyway, even though they do like the bare ground. So create structure in your garden, plant a variety of plants, shrubs, and trees. And your taller plants in the back and your smaller ones in the front. I know you're gonna ask me about deer. Well, you know what deer are like, right? they they can eat it one day and not the next, but uh, here's some deer resistant, the, the gum weed, uh, shooting star, uh, sage, curly everlasting, woolly sunflower, sea blush, and yarrow. So even if you could try those, when you have a lot of deer around, you would be creating some habitat for native pollinators. Also consider that pollinators do not like double flowers. Oh, they're pretty, pretty, but they like an open flower. Uh, you gotta make it easy peasy for them. So they like the uh, composite flowers, the disc flowers. They like to be able to land on it. And especially butterflies, they like that landing pattern. So I'm going to go over some of the recommended nectar plants for bees and butterflies. Um, all these uh, flowers I'm about to show you uh, are from the Satin Flower Nursery, which is one of my, my favorite native plant nursery. Down. They used to be called Saneach, uh, Saneach Native Plant Nursery, uh, but they're down on the Saneach Peninsula. Uh, so I want you to notice the colors, okay? Remember what I said about how bees see colors. So here we have yellow broadleaf stone crop. We have camas and the great camas. Both of these can take a long time to bloom. They have a historical significance where they're indigenous people. The great camas can take up to five to nine years to bloom. And the common camas can take uh, three to four years to bloom. So uh, patients, I have some out there. I'm gonna mark them with um, popsicle sticks so I don't do anything nasty to them and watch them flourish. And here's another one. See that open flower that the bees and butterflies would like to show from. Still noticing the color. Look at all the yellow. We've got the lavender sea blush. Goldenrod is a great one. It's a late bloomer. Uh, a lot of uh, insects come to that. We've got spring gold, gumweed, uh, mock orange is a beautiful early one. Ocean spray is a, a significant one, and you'll see in a minute. Uh, the yarrow again, and woolly sunflower. I told you those were the resistant. The red flowering current, this is a nice one for hummingbirds as well. Um, tall Oregon grape, yellow, you see the colors, shooting star, uh, broadleaf shooting star, and the nodding onion. That's the late one as well. Uh, Salal, um, we've got this common celery. This is yellow, stinging nettle. I, I wanna talk about stinging nettle. You might be going, ooh, but you might in your property be able to devote a patch to stinging nettle and I'll tell you why later. And also fireweed is a big giant of a thing. If you can do a patch to fireweed, that would be nice too. Uh, hard hack, uh, notice the colors again. Self heal, uh, desert parsley, and alum root. And also, 
Clouds can come and go, but the trees are here forever. If you have big leaf maples, they're a great early food for pollinators. Uh, the red alder, um, the june plum, and any of the willow trees. Those are early as well. So trees count too. I want to talk about butterflies quickly because butterflies are different. Um, for butterflies, it's all about the nectar. They are a flower visitor. They can transfer pollen, but they are all about the nectar. On Vancouver Island, we have about 70 species. Uh, most of them uh, don't migrate. They're here all year round as either an egg, a larva, a pupa, or, or an adult. So they overwinter in any of those stages. But butterflies, they spend a good part of their life as caterpillars and the caterpillars need a host plant and that's why they are different. Um, they need a host plant for, uh, for food uh, and they also need uh, nectar. So you need uh, to really think about um, their needs to be a proper pollinator gardener. They also, um, Yet uh, they also drink water from, I've seen them from, from mud. So um, not so much from uh, watering dishes I put out. Here are some of our Vancouver Island um, butterflies. This is from the Davis Suzuki Foundation, which is I think in Ontario or whatever. Uh, some of them are here, uh, the cabbage white, I see a lot of, uh, it's an introduced species. The monarch, however, has been cited here for, uh, Maybe. Maybe 2014. It's 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 in the decline. Um, again, it's habitat. It could be migratory roots, but uh, the roots for migra migration. Uh, we get skippers, painted ladies, swallowtails, red admirals. We get a really nice variety of butterflies on the island. To attract butterflies, here's some of our local butterflies. You can see that. Oh, this uh, the angel wings seem metal. The red admirals seem metal. Oh, okay. Some of these other ones. So they need those. Those are host plants for uh, butterflies. Um, so it tells you if you want to attract, look, look, look to see what you do have. Ocean spray here for the Western Spring Azure. I think ocean spray is up here for a few other ones as well. Um, so there are 10 different local butterflies that lay their eggs on either ocean spray or skinny metal. So if you have those, you can create that habitat for them. So a butterfly garden, a good one, has, uh, you will host all the life cycles and phases of a butterfly, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. So that includes the host and the nectar plant, okay? They like sunny spots, just like the bees. So plant your garden in a sunny spot and plant a diversity again. So you have su succession of flowering times all season long. So if you want them to stay and lay, here's some of those host native plants. Again, ocean spray was the one that kept coming up. Stinging nettle kept coming up. If you can create a patch with those two, then you might be able to have some uh, butterflies uh, growing on them and growing up on them and pupating on them and growing out as adults. So you've got willows, again, those nectar plants, hardhack, which I've told you about, nine bark, all these nice natives. I want to talk about water because we think um, by putting out water, um, there's a trick to it. Um, I've done this. Uh, where I have the marbles, you don't cover the marbles with water because they need marbles, especially butterflies and bees. They need a surface to sit on to drink. So the water has to be down quite low among the marbles, but you're going to have to monitor that every day to keep the water low because I've seen bees and butterflies go down in. If it's too high, they will drown that the water surface tension seems to draw them in. Here's another one. You can do a pie plate with some rocks. They need those crevices and the water level to be just below that uh, so they can get in there and have some safety while they drink water. Um, I don't know where, um, I put out water for our honeybees. Now. They don't drink 
from what I give them. I don't know where they go, but um, I have seen um, the native bees in the grasses and I'll put it out and see what you get. I want to talk about these B&Bs um, uh, that we, uh, we purchase um, and the logs and things. Nature provides, you know, when you garden, leave those stems and invest disposable, those uh, twigs, you know, a bee wouldn't use it the next year. But what happens when you buy these houses? You get, the bees come back with pollen, but in that pollen are mites. And what do those mites do? They feed on the eggs. So you'll get, often these will get full of uh, mites feeding on the, the young bees. So this is a good uh, mason bee house because see the layers there, they come off and you can clean it. You can take it out uh, after they've, uh, you take the cocoons out and you can clean it and take out all those mites and then the pollen mites and make it to their best. There's been some mason bee experts that call these things uh, cemeteries, bee cemeteries, because they just get full of mites and they just go in there and, and they die uh, because of that. So make sure if you do get the tubes that you can take them out and clean them. Be, be a proper responsible mason beekeeper. So bees do like pith filled stems. Um, you know, they break off naturally uh, in nature, but you can also cut them off too. Uh, and this is uh, again, uh, a bee going into a pith, making a brood chamber. They actually use nature. They don't need us to buy a bee and bee house from Costco. But what they do need you to do is to, when you clean up your garden, keep some stems cut and open and in a different range of heights. You can cut them off to about 30 centimeters. Uh, your pithy stems, your, they like the berry canes, the rose stems. If you have roses, please. Don't cut them too short. Um, and then of course, all these hollow stemmed uh, sunflowers, goldenrod, you know, it goes on. Um, but think of the bees. So you have to be a different kind of gardener if you're gonna have a pollinator garden. And you have to embrace the circles. Isn't that artistic? Oh, I just love the circles. So actions you can take, educate yourself about pollinators. You know, when you decide to do your garden and the plants you pick, I, I hopefully I've given you enough to think about bare ground, to think about early, middle, late, to think about variety and color. Plant natives for native pollinators. Uh, learn about invasive plants. Please do not plant invasive plants. Use the natives. Be choosy about your plants. It matters. Make it matter to you because it matters to the native pollinators. And landscape for caterpillars. Again, those host plants for the butterflies and the moths, they bring in the birds, all this counts. And have fun, have fun. It's a beautiful world, have fun. And here's a meadow of, uh, I, I wish I had that in my backyard, but uh, I don't. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you a little quiz here to end it. Here we go. Do native bees sting? And I guess I forgot to mention it. Uh, not really. Uh, some have stingers that um, can't penetrate the skin. Uh, bumblebees will sting, but you gotta, you gotta manhandle them something wicked before they sting. Uh, some don't have any stingers. The male bees, native bees do not have stingers. So native bees, you could say generally do not. Is the bumblebee a keystone species? Is it a keystone species? Yes, it is. Good for you. The bumblebee plus all the other native bees are keystone species. And we have scientists and biologists watching their populations, making sure we keep, keep track and that we get citizen science and people like yourselves interested in gardening for our native pollinators. True or false, 70% of native bees live underground. Well, it's kind of a 50-50 chance here. But what you have to remember is, yes, they do. More than half of all our native bees live underground. Bare ground, people, bare ground. 
Name the four components of habitat. If you have a garden, you have potential habitat for pollinators. What are they? Food, water, space, and shelter. Can bees see red? Well, maybe when they get mad, but <laughs> no, bees cannot see red. And I know you got 100% on that. And if I want you to leave with anything, it would be the answers to those five questions right there. I'd like to thank the Island Pollinator Initiative, uh, Insight Citizen Science, Fat and Flower. These are all good resources for you to go to. It's uh, listed in your handout. The flower doesn't dream of the bee. It blossoms and the bee comes. Thank you, Joanne. We've just had a comment about just great information and this will be a great recording of the slideshow. Uh, your slideshow was amazing. And one of the first comments we got in the chat was that the photo on your first slide was excellent. <laughs> and your images in general, amazing. And then a question about um, any photography tips, like how to photograph insects so well. Uh, Joe gave a little bit of an answer in the chat, um, a great zoom lens and slow aperture. I don't know, do you have any other tips, Joanne? I do not. It's patience is number one and practice is another. There's no quick answer, like anything, just go out and try it and do it, but no. I, I don't. I'm right. sorry. Yeah, just doing it over and over, and I think you're right. Patience yeah. and uh, yeah. yeah, using the right equipment. Yeah. Um, all right, a few little comments and questions. Uh, do you know if bees like the fuchsia plant? I know they're sort of reddish, but they're purple. The fuchsia flower. Is that a good one? Well, I think it's a it's a garden plant. I'm sure. It, it's not to say that bees don't like other plants. Of course, they'll go where there's nectar and they'll go where it's easy. If uh, they don't like so much uh, plants that you have to tunnel into, like I think the fuchsia has a, a bit of a trumpet or it's not so open faced, but they'll go where it's easy. They're just like people. Um, so if you see them using it, go for it. I don't really know. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then just sort of a comment that if somebody has a shady garden and so they've mostly got shade blooms, are those a little less preferable than the, the sun, the blooming flowers that go well in the sun? Yeah. Not to say that bees never go into the shade, but that would be, that's their preference. If you're going to do a butterfly bee garden, put it into the sun. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and having little bits of bare ground, of course, everyone wants to mulch. It's so good for the garden to mulch. So where do you suggest having bare ground? Could you do it? Could you have sort of rocks like a rockery yeah. or some old wood? You know, I have seen uh, bumblebees and wasps go into our rockery because there's cavities behind there. Uh, what you have to remember is they like to tunnel. Most of the bees like to tunnel. Uh, so they need bare ground to do that. So uh, they suggest when you're planting for pollinators is to plant grass, bunches of grass. And under that grass, there's a lot of bare ground. Uh, so that's what I've done is planted grass in spots, uh, thus creating patches of bare ground under the grasses. Oh, great. Okay. That's yeah. a good idea. And somebody had a tip and uh, maybe you can confirm this, that uh, they found that um, because hoover flies are attracted to alyssum, that ground cover sort of flower alyssum, yep. um, if you planted that around your roses, that that would attract the hoover flies and then they would eat the aphids off the roses. Oh, well, that makes perfect sense to me. That's exactly how our gardener thinks. Exactly. That's a great idea. Yep. Thank you for that tip, whoever that was. Uh, and then a question, um, what time of year do mason bees lay their eggs? Maybe Oh, something. they are early and they are busy and then they're not. Uh, so they are probably the first ones out. Um, I, I, I don't recall, I mean, um, April, May. Oh, yeah. They're really early and, and they're only six weeks at the most. So, um, Okay. You have to start early if you want them. Um, 
because you can buy cocoon, which like from, from Bunker Fields. But if you're going to do that, please have the proper uh, habitat for them. Get uh, a bee house that you can clean or the paper tubes that have liners. Um, they like to be uh, just just read up on mason bees. Uh, right. You know, practice due diligence with uh, trying to have them because every year you'll go, oh, I started off with a, a house and maybe th- one bee filled it. Uh, no, didn't fill it. Put in some bees. Uh, some that she laid yeah. as much as she could, this one bee. You know, I don't know where she came from. I just put the uh, the house, I hadn't hung it. And I put it on the ground of the back deck. And she uh, felt it. And then the next year, there were so many bees that got full. And then I thought, where's the babies? Where are they going to go? Well, then we had to build another house. <laughs> so every year, you're going to have exponentially more bees. So you have to really think about raising Mason bees, because you will have fifty percent more. Okay, right. So, yes, yeah. yeah, so I have a neighbor that. Yeah, I was. I was going to say they're they're fantastic pollinators of uh, orchards, and they, they do a better job than the honeybee at pollination. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay, and then someone's making a comment that uh, they have a lot of herbs, and they let their herbs go to flower, and that seems to really attract bees as well. Absolutely. Herb gardens are awesome for bees. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm wondering, Joanne, would it be too difficult to go back to the slide of that native garden plan so that we can see that URL that where they can go to see that plan? That okay. Was- it was, it was Guelph. I could maybe type cause it was. No, about- I, I'll go back. Cause I know that's a really good one. Yeah, and I'll type it in the chat, whoever was asking for that, because this it, one, right here. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. So it's uh, guelph.ca. Um, and I mean, it's got living uh, slash living slash house. Oh, it's, it's a long one. Um, yes. I'm going to type it a little bit here in the chat. Long but I think if you put uh, Guelph and then you did uh, native garden designs, because uh, that's right but i just thought that was really good it's a really nice one yes yeah okay i think i've got it (laughs) all right thank you yeah that's a really nice plan um i think that is the end of the comments and questions and we're getting lots of great presentation thank you so much And Joanne, thank you very much for that presentation today. What beautiful slides, beautiful images. That was really entertaining, super interesting.